Hello and welcome to news break at 7 this Friday evening. I'm Bida Raghava. Top focus this evening, rage triggered by petty disputes leading to violent crimes. In another shocker from Madhya Pradesh's Indore, which was caught on camera, a fight between two pet dogs on a walk turned into a brawl between their owners and ended with one of them, a security guard at a bank, opening fire from his balcony, killing two people and injuring six others in that locality. That man with the gun on your screens is Rajpal Singh Rajawat, the security guard at a bank. His neighbor, Vimal Amcha, died on the spot. Scary scenes there, like we've witnessed before, just caught on camera now. A petty fight turning into a brawl and then turning into something so disastrous. Remember, this is not the first time that such sudden rage over a petty quarrel has turned into a violent crime. Bengaluru itself witnessed cases as recently as April this year where a man was killed after a fight over dog poop and another case of a murder after a fight over loud music. So is it rage, frustration, just mindlessness? What could be triggering these and what do we need to introspect or understand as a society? Is there something very deep down that one needs to understand? Joining us this evening, renowned clinical psychologist Dr. Jayanti Datta and Dr. Praveen Chintapani, psychiatrist with the Apollo Hospitals and Tranquil Minds. They join us this evening. Thank you too for being here with us. Dr. Jayanti Datta, Thank you. Uh, you. it seems yes. that there is some bottled up frustration and it's just blowing out suddenly. I mean, how do we explain these incidents? I'm not saying that each of them or all of them are similar, but as a psychologist, does it worry you when you see these kind of crimes? It does. It does because it is something, you know, it's not just a stray incident. It's they are the ones who are indulging in this. They are suffering, you know, and this suffering is coupled with fearlessness. You know, there is a, a kind of a feeling of grandiosity. I can do it. I can get away with it. How can anybody defy me? How can anybody say no to me? And this is what is the worrisome component. There is no fear of punishment at all. See, all these things which we are seeing, the uh, the. Brutalities can go on. It's not only the killing. Even after killing, you know, putting the thing in the cooker, chopping them into parts. Now the incidents you are quoting, this man must have had emotional outbursts and that affects the family. So my worry is not just one or two killings, not just one or two lives, but the whole series of people who are getting affected because of this one particular candidate who is not able to manage the emotions, the stress, the frustration. So it is the family, you know, which goes through right. this. And mind you, all of them have children. And these children, they are slowly groomed into potential criminals. Because when you uh, live in an right. oppressive environment with fear and with this kind of dictate, you have to have some kind of a ventilation somewhere. And that is why we are witnessing, you know, right. 14 years killing the mother, 16 years killing the girlfriend, 15 years you said no, so they killed. Now there, these two pet dogs were fighting was not the major issue. The issue was, how can you not listen to me and this is persistingly witnessed even in your own neighborhood with the slightest opportunity important they take to violence yes you're saying something right. important point that you make there uh, dr praveen uh, uh, you know uh, in the sense that the trigger can be anything uh, and well okay this incident gets caught on camera so we tend to focus on it as a violent crime but there are many things that go unnoticed and it's sort of bottling up inside. Uh, is there something at a societal level that's going wrong? Is there something that we need to be uh, aware to address this? Thank you for having me. Uh, primarily, I mean, at societal level, if you look at it, we have become less tolerant uh, as we transit from what we were calling ourselves as a social and a community-oriented person to an autonomous individual-centric uh, communities. I mean, earlier we used to live as 
you know, a village, a community, a society, a, 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 it was much more a cohesive thing. Now we are getting much more individualistic, mera space, my time, me time. And this I-ness, I think that's the core of what's happening, which is leading to intolerance towards a fellow individual to a great extent. I think that's something which we need to constantly address rather than, you know, superficially trying to bandage it, uh, saying that this is an individual, you know, discrete incident. And I firmly believe that we all are capable of throwing a punch when we get triggered. It, it need not be like, you know, the serene, nice person next door, he can be triggered to throw a punch when he gets the right word. Like, you know, if somebody utters, uh, you know, People say, a volume come, Karlo, Bajit, there's a party happening next door, and you go and knock on the door, say, reduce the volume. I have a sick mother who is sleeping, and then the guy doesn't reduce the volume. You knock again, and then say, the other guy uses a mother word or, you know, a foul word or something, which might trigger the person and throw, make him throw a punch. So everybody has an inner potential to really lash out or, you know, throw a punch. But I think, the community and, and yes, activity. as you pointed out, it's not it's not restricted to uh, it's not restricted to one strata of the society. It's not restricted to mm -hmm. one economic group. It's across the board. I mean, just to point out, while this incident, as as I said, was a very violent crime and agreed, and we've seen violent crimes. It's often that you have petty quarrels, even in high society or educated classes, or, or on over over dogs barking or whether pets can be allowed in a colony. I mean, is that is that also a problem of affluence and a problem of right that comes in? Uh, I mean, larger issues don't seem to matter and small things can trigger into big uh, major disputes between uh, between people, even in highly educated and affluent societies. Dr. Jayanti? Yes, surely. Because primarily what is happening, if you look at the psychodynamic, the thing is it's a majorly a displacement. A displacement of your frustration, the source could be anywhere. The anger, the cause could be anything, anywhere. But, you know, to be less tolerant is not the only issue. It is that desire to, you know, manifest that I am the big one. I can get away with anything. And this is, you know, as Adler said, basically it's the burning inferiority complex within you, which pushes you. When you say, see somebody else is doing better than you, you are not able to achieve that standard. What happens? You feel frustrated. You feel stressed. And all your hormones, you know, your adrenaline, your cortisol, all those things uh, mounted. And then there is a bursting out. And with the smallest opportunity, you burst out like this, and you can kill anybody. For that matter, it need not be just a fight. Right. It could be anything, you know, any ajuar, any excuse, and you can uh, kill. Right. And you see no. that message, which the society uh, is badly affected because of that, is message is not clear that you have done it, you have killed a person, you're going to be punished okay. immediately. People take it easy. They can get away with it. Dr. Dr. Praveen, Dr. Praveen, uh, is there something, I mean, what do we then tell our next generation? Uh, we are seeing this getting worse. Uh, it's possibly, I mean, maybe because we hear about it, maybe because of social media, maybe because of information. Perhaps it was always a malice in the society. But there is a sense that this is increasing, growing as a trend in our society. Uh, how? What do we transmit then to the next generation? What lessons have we learned? Is there something that we can take as a remedial course? Yes, uh I think that's a valid point in terms of actually what could be done to remediate the situation. Many of the countries, especially in Europe and especially the Scandinavian part of the world, they've been working on specific incidents like road rage. What builds up to a rage leading to violent acts? Uh, and then like the rage within the family, the domestic violence incidents which happen, what leads to a place where there is an incident which leads to a physical aggression or uh, homicide or otherwise? I think these have been analyzed in detail. And in terms of if I were to teach my children or the next generation to me, I think I would try to teach them how to go about sharing things and also how to go about being more tolerant about differences amongst people. We are going to be different. And 
third most thing I would talk about, talk about is managing your you know, frustration. That's what we call as frustration tolerance. There are lots of things in the world which happen which we don't like the, or they don't go the way we want them to go. I think that's when a man's you know, a civilization, a man in terms of man or a woman, but the civilization or a culture, that's what is reflected in when you can tolerate frustration, when you can tolerate uncertainty. The four factors I talk about is being accepting other person, tolerating frustration, sharing and being a bit more an accepting of differences amongst the communities. These four things I'd look at. Perhaps all these are reminders that mental health needs to be taken. Sorry, ma'am. I wanted to add on what I practice with my young patients who, you know, very often indulge in defiance and then bursting into anger. So I practice two, three things. One I practice is the mindfulness. Second, I practice is the yoga. Third, I practice is the uh, kind of uh, uh, attachment with some kind of an, a spiritual activity. It could be anything. It could be Gurdwara, right. it could be Masjid, it could be Temple. Important Where, points you know, that you the make the there. Kami. Perhaps spiritualism is spiritualism and, 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 and you know, spiritualism in any form could possibly be a healer is what yes. you're saying. But there are other aspects as well. Uh, perhaps important to address mental health as an issue. I'm really sorry. We're completely out of time on this. I'm sorry to have cut you in on that. But thank you too for joining us and sharing your thoughts on it. Uh, perhaps it's important for us to introspect as a society to build perhaps a far more uh, healthier mentally uh, society as a whole. From anger management now to internet addiction amongst adolescents. Thousands of parents struggle with their adolescent children being addicted to the internet and devices leading to serious psychological and physical consequences. While there are many socio-economic factors that lead to such addiction, an extremely interesting study by researchers at Bengaluru's Nimhans has found specific aspects of parental behavior that could heighten the risk of such addiction. Aspects like decreased care and increased control from mothers specifically, rejection from both parents and increased autonomy from fathers are flagged off from that study as risk factors. Joining us now, Dr. Bino Thomas, Associate Professor of Psychiatric Social Work at NIMHANS, who led that study. He joins us, sir. Thank you so much for taking time out to speaking to us. Uh, some very deep findings in your study, but before we discuss the core details of this relationship, uh, could you quickly explain to us how you define internet addiction? Given that all of us use and are dependent on the internet, when do we define an adolescent as being addicted to internet? Well, we can actually look for certain indicators. For example, uh, there is a continuous uh, desire to use internet-based activities and uh, this use becomes the prioritized activity in their life. And thirdly, there is continuous use despite the knowledge of harm. And the fourth point is there is functional impairment, especially when it comes to adolescent, it affects, starts affecting their social life, real peer relationship and their academics. So in a way, you would actually see that there is a craving, there is a compulsion, and there is also a coping. Uh, they use internet for dealing with their negative emotions. And there is a consequence of uh, these internet-based activities. Well, sir, the study throws up some very interesting findings on aspects of parental behavior and how that could push an adolescent to internet addiction. Can you elaborate on the key findings like, for instance, rejection by parents? There are several studies which talk about parental behaviors that causes mental health issues uh, in adolescents and children. Now, our study primarily looked at if there are any parental behaviors which are closely associated with in, uh, internet addiction among adolescents. And we found that uh, when both parents actually uh, use more of control or when they are actually uh, rejecting the needs of adolescents, we see that there is a higher chances of adolescents getting into a uh, internet-based activities or addiction. So which would mean that uh, sometime parents may not have adequate time or sometime parents may not think that this is a, an important issue for the adolescents to be dealt with. Hence, they may not uh, adequately spend time with them, wherein they may not be able to understand what adolescent is going through, wherein, as I said, adolescent might uh, end up using internet-based activities to cope with uh, their own emotional issues. 
Sir, interestingly, the study also throws light on certain aspects of how mothers relate with or deal with adolescents vis-a-vis -vis a father's relationship and reveals possible trends. Correct. Uh, traditionally, we have a society where parents, uh, fathers used to be the control center and mothers to show the affection. In the, in the recent uh, literature and studies, we find that fathers have actually started spending a little more affectionate role and then mothers actually have taken up more control. So this is also indicate that probably mothers are actually doing so many things for the children and they know what is best for the child. But uh, re resorting to this control mechanism with adolescents becomes a major challenge because adolescents want freedom. They want to use their own brain to do things. Uh, wherein the parents might feel that uh, they need to guide them and it is their responsibility to guide them. So, wherein they may not feel a lot of confidence with adolescents uh, for their own decision making. And that's where they actually get into conflict. So, here uh, we actually started seeing that uh, mothers actually doing more controlling behaviors rather than the fathers. And in the study, we also found that when fathers are actually less control centric we find that the adolescent uh, internet based activity is actually less we really do we really have to actually re-examine if that is true sir most importantly what i mean you know from all this study what should parents do to ensure their children are not driven to internet addiction i mean what should a father be most conscious about and uh, what should a mother be most conscious about I really do not want want to blame the parents that it is because of them the children actually get into uh, addiction behaviors. You know, there are also child related uh, issues that actually makes them get into internet addiction. Basically, uh, there are a couple of indicators if they have learning related issues or they have hyperactivity related issues or there is an emotion or another behavioral problem, they all actually become additional factors. Now, uh, every family has their own stories and narratives. So, so in a platform like this, I would be able to actually tell the parents that they really need to examine if any of their behaviors prevent adolescents to openly communicate with them or uh, con confide uh, information with parents. So they really have to change that kind of a behavior so that uh, there is a, an open communication is enhanced at uh, family. And most importantly, uh, if there is an open communication, if that is improved in a family level, that actually gives more chance for the parents to trust the adolescents. And it also gives a chance for the adolescents to uh, believe uh, in the parents. So what happens is that in such kind of a situation, the judgmental attitudes that actually uh, get reflected in uh, parental behaviors in rejection or control behaviors will also be minimized. Often uh, parents say that this child is always on the phone but child has a different story i am actually doing uh, homework or some other things but parents when they view it it is basically always on the phone so uh, open communication is the key and in that you know uh, we also need to encourage quality time for the entire family uh, probably like people say researchers say uh, digital fasting is one of the best techno best technique to use which means that there has to be a protected time in the family where nobody uses technology, nobody uses devices, and there is a lot of uh, social life, a lot of engagement, talking, communication. That's actually the key uh, at this point of time, I could actually advise. But if there are serious problems, then uh, one has to actually make a decision to approach to uh, professionals. For example, we have a Niman's uh, Digital Detox app is there, or we have a short clinic at Niman's. Anybody can actually utilize the services there so that we will be able to give individualized uh, care plan for them. So fascinating insights. I think it's extremely important for parents to understand this. Uh, more care and less control is the prescription. Balance of both. A balance of both. A balance of both. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bino Thomas, for that study as well as sharing those thoughts. Obviously, it could help enormous number of parents who struggle with fighting internet addiction amongst their children. One needs to reflect at the parental behavior as well. And as Dr. Bino Thomas points out, other factors are there. This is also one factor. Well, moving on, finally today, time to meet Noor B, who calls herself the nomadi hijabi rider, the girl from Chennai who's now settled in Bengaluru along with a few other women. 
Wearing a hijab and riding bikes in India is breaking stereotypes across the country. After her travels across India, Noor is now preparing for a biking expedition all the way to Mecca. She's just recovering from an accident and her bike is recovering as well. Joining us this Friday evening, Noor B. Noor, thanks so much for taking time out to speak to us. Uh, before we get into what you want to do and what you're going to do next, let's talk a bit about how you got here. How did you get into biking? How did your family react? Just take us through your journey. Please unmute, Noor. You're on mute. You need to unmute yourself. Yes. So, uh, Assalamu Alaikum and Wanakam to everyone. Uh, I just, uh, maybe biking is very new to me, I would say, like, it's been two years I got into this biking field. Uh, everybody loved this biking, right? So I come from a place, like, I, I'm from Pallavram, so uh, we always, like, be a pillion rider, but uh, right from school and colleges, I, I'm so fascinated with the bike, uh, biking thing. And uh, I was just randomly getting bikes from random people three, four times. And fourth time, I thought, like, why don't I get our own bike and let me go on the road? And uh, fourth time is when I got a bike from Bangalore, Indranagar, and uh, I just got into the road on the first day itself. I was able to cover with my confidence and boldness. I was able to cover 450 kilometer. I started from Indranagar and then I paused in uh, uh, Hubli, which is which comes to 450 kilometer. And then I got a confidence that I can go on road. So then I started exploring seven months I was on road. Yeah. Okay. But how did your family react when you started off? Okay. <laughs> it, I'm very sure like it wasn't easy for my family to accept. But then I had to stop and tell when I reached Mumbai, I had to tell them that I'm going on a long expedition and then they started crying. But now I have to say my family, my Ami, my Abba and my brother Basha and my sister Mariam, they all are like supporting me for the next expedition, which I'm planning, inshallah. Uh, Noor, we've, we've had the hijab controversy here in Bengaluru and Karnataka. What's the message that you take across when you bike? I mean, this is not just about biking. Uh, you know, when you wear the hijab and you go biking, what's the message that you're sending across? What's the stereotype that you want to break? Okay, so I want to share this here. Maybe I'll use this platform. So when this hijab controversy was happening, like uh, I was uh, riding in different parts of India, I just got a call uh, from my parents saying that a big controversy, a controversial thing is happening in uh, uh, in some place of India. So please be very, very careful. So uh, to to my surprise, you own belief. Uh, I. Uh, People in, uh, you know, Gurudwara and also temple, Hindu temple and also ashram, they welcomed me uh, irrespective of what I was wearing. So when they saw me wearing hijab, they welcomed me and they gave me stay and they made me so comfortable. And uh, I didn't face any issue on road, uh, you know, with what I was wearing. People respected me uh, for what I was. Yeah. Fascinating that you say this, but what's the stereotype that you'd like to break as a girl from Pallavaram in Chennai wearing the hijab and driving across the board uh, as a message to women uh, across the board, whether it is Muslim or Hindu or uh, Sikh or Christian, what is the message that you're sending across and what's the stereotype that you'd like to break? Okay, so I'm from a small place like Pallavaram. I don't not sure if many people know, but uh... Uh, the stereotype which I want to bring it like is uh, if you have some dream or if you ha if you're passionate about something, no matter what you wear and what you do, like stick to it and uh, whole world, whole world, I mean universe will support you no matter what. And also just respect and be kind to all. And that's what I wanted to say. Nothing more than that. Oh, interesting. And now you are all set now to bike all the way to Mecca. That's your dream. You may be biking through Pakistan as well in this Afghanistan yes. and Pakistan as you head to Mecca. What, 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 is there something that worries you or is there a message that you're going to take across the world? Uh, sorry, I just uh, lost you in between. Can you please repeat it, Veera? You're planning to go to Mecca next on your bike. That's your dream right now, which you'll possibly be biking if you manage to do that through Pakistan and Afghanistan and, you know, the other Middle Eastern countries. What is your what's the message that you will be carrying from India across the world? 
Okay, so I want to just say here that uh, I'll be covering, uh, inshallah, I'll be covering uh, 10 countries. Uh, I'll be starting with, uh, I will be starting from Chennai with Tamil Nadu registration bike where I wanted to take it to all the countries. Uh, if you have some dream, please chase and do not compromise on your de uh, dream. And also wherever you go, uh, respect and be kind to everyone. So that's something I wanted to say. Yeah. And no matter what you wear or what you do, uh, just respect and be good to everyone. Yeah. Are you a bit nervous about a long trip to Mecca? Not at all. I'm so excited. I'm just waiting for the right. I mean, I'm waiting for the time to start my biking. Yeah. I'm sure your energy will take you all the distance that you need to do. Thank you so much, Noor. All Inshallah. the best for your biking uh, expeditions and have a safe journey all across the board. Thank you so much for joining us here on NDTV. Thank That's all we so have much. time for on this show this Friday evening. Uh,